Welcome to MOOC course on introduction to proteogenomics. After understanding the two approaches for pathway enrichment and basic differences between both the approaches, we will now listen Dr. Kasten Krug who will explain the use of GSEA at the pathway level analysis for different PTMs by taking an example of phosphodata. Dr. Krug will talk about the way one could analyze the available data at gene level to take it to the PTM level. He will also talk about the recent work which is an initiative to make a PTM site curated database at Broad Institute. This involves a scoring of each piece site by mapping it against the database. So, let us now welcome Dr. Kasten to talk more about how GSEA can be used to map PTM pathways for the analysis. So, now I am going to talk about phosphodata, but this is actually true for all kinds of PDMs. So, there we measure different phosphorylation sites on, on proteins, right? And it might happen that we have multiple phosphocytes on the same protein. It might happen that we have different isoforms of the same gene or protein, you know, which, with, with, uh, and we measure different phosphocytes on that, um, and so on and so forth. But in order to do pathway analysis, all of these pathway databases are gene centric. As I said, the pathway is a list of genes. So right now, all of the databases that we have are curated at a gene level. So, meaning if you want to do any pathway level analysis of our phospho data, you first have to collapse all of these measurements of phospho sites into gene level. So, we're basically throwing away a lot of information, but that's, this is something we have to deal with right now because there's not, there are no databases that are curated at PDM site level or at protein or isoform level. So, you would do that by, for example, taking the average per gene or median or looking across the most variable site, you know, across your samples. So, variance means information, so that is why you would, put, you would pick that one. So, this is one example which where uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, employed this approach. Uh, this is again from the breast cancer study uh, published in Nature two years back, where you know, we, we started with uh, roughly uh, 6,000 fossil proteins and performed the same type of analysis I just said. So, we use single sample GCA to map these phospho proteins, which we of course first collapse to genes using a, a median ratio and so on and so forth. We, we projected those into the space of pathways, 900 pathways. And then we performed consensus clustering on this data matrix. And interestingly, we saw like a, like a clustering, like a unique cluster which we only saw in pathway space and not, we would not have seen that if we would look at phosphocyte or phosphoprotein level. So, that is one example where these kind of analysis where you just, you know, project your data onto a higher level of annotation and perform some analysis can give you new insights that you would probably have missed if you would not have done that. Can you please use the mic that everybody can understand you? So, just to understand, you are saying according to uh, each gene and or according to uh, uh, our biological function, it will arrange the phosphocytes. No, here we are not looking at phosphocytes anymore. So, no, you are clustering that phosphocytes in each signaling pathway. Isn't no, we calculate for each. I mean, we, now we are looking, we are not looking at phosphocytes, but each row is a pathway. And the data is actually the enrichment score I was describing a couple of slides back. Yeah. So, we already co combined all phosphocytes to phosphoproteins to genes, and then we perform our uh, signature projection method. So, meaning in each sample, so these are the 77 breast cancer samples that we are looking at here, and in each sample we have a score, an enrichment score for this particular pathway. Right. So, red means this pathway is more active, 
blue means this pathway is less active in this particular sample. And then we can do, in this case, we, we, we've done an unsupervised cluster analysis on that. So a very convenient way to, you know, combine multiple measurements of phosphocytes that map to the same gene uh, to to the same, like to a gene-centric cent gene level is actually uh, Morpheus, which is a ver very versatile matrix visualization tool. We're going to use it again in hands-on. It's very powerful, but we are only going to use it for, for this particular purpose here. So just like to repeat um, what I've just said, so we start with a data matrix, which can be either proteins, phosphocytes, or genes, or transcripts, whatsoever. But the first step that we always have to do is we have to roll up our expression values to the level of genes. Because all of these databases that we are use, using for our pathway analysis are gene-centric. And after we have done that, then we can continue with our pathway analysis, employing GSEA, single sample GSEA, you know, it's David, or there's so many different tools and approaches out there. It's, you know, a matter of taste, what you like more. But we highly recommend and we highly prefer doing some sort of GSEA, genes enrichment type of analysis. Because you don't have to throw away, you don't have to filter your list beforehand. So, as I just told you, all of these databases that are available now are curated at the gene centric level. And I just want to uh, introduce you to like a project that we are doing uh, at the board together with many other, other collaborators where we actually tried to uh, come up with a pathway database that is curated at the site level, at the phosphor site level. So this involves many people uh, and many resources. Oh, here, let's stay here for a, mo for a moment. Um, so we call that uh, the, P the PTM signatures database, uh, which in theory, or th that's actually the goal to be able to score each and every single phosphorylation site like, directly against the database. And that's a large curation effort, as you can imagine. It's very difficult to curate pathways at the gene level. But if you want to even uh, you know, go deeper and want to curate at every single phosphorylation site, what does it do in this pathway? Go, does it go up or down? And, and is it involved at all? So it's a lot of curation effort. Um, and most of the signatures are human. We started to do that for mouse and rat too, but uh, it's, it's mostly human. So we teamed up with uh, other database curators from Phosphocyte Plus, from NetPath, also uh, Wikipathways, as I, I mentioned earlier. And you know, with the help of all of these uh, people involved here, we uh, you know, started to curate this, uh, this database. Another very important aspect when you want to do something like this is how do I represent the PDM site robustly? Which might sound trivial, but it's actually like a big problem. Like gene symbols have been standardized in a way, right? This is, there are these Hugo gene symbols which try to harmonize and standardize human gene symbols. If you look into protein databases, you know, you look, the same protein might have a different accession number in one database, so this is now a Unipod database. If you look up the same protein in RefSeq, it will have a completely different unrelated ID, so it's very difficult to cross-reference those, right? And this is even more, uh, like an even more severe problem if you look at PDM sites. So how do, you, how do you robustly represent a PDM site? So there's uh, different ways how we try to, to approach this problem. So one is uh, uh, Unipod-centric. So Unipod is a well, highly curated path, uh, uh, protein database. So, you know, we picked Unipod and we represent the site as Unipod ID, the modified residue, and the PDM type. And in this database, we also have information whether it goes up or down in a specific pathway or perturbation. So another a uh, way to represent uh, phosphocyte are flanking sequences. So this is what we just looked at in the morning, right? So we look at uh, like plus minus six or seven amino acids or whatsoever, you know, around the phosphorylation site. This is a pretty unique 
identify already if you compare that in the human polio. And also phosphocyplasts, they are actually trying to uh, come up with an unambiguous way to group sites across or within protein families. Just keep in mind, you know, this residue number might change if you look at isoform A or isoform B, right? It might be the same site, but the residue number might be completely different. So the site group ID tries to harmonize those kind of uh, uh, events. Okay, so I'll quickly go through here. So, uh, so right now we have like pathways, we have kind of substrate signatures, so we talked about, and we have a lot of perturbations by growth factors, also small, small molecules in this database. And uh, so most of them, like these pathways, have been completely <laughs> manually curated by curators from, from NetPath, WikiPathways, and we also extracted signatures sem semi-automatically and fully automatically. So this is, we try to come up with, uh, with a standardized way how to extract automatically, aut automatically derive these kind of signatures from known literature. Um, let me quickly go through these slides here. So, and actually in order to extract these signatures, we came up with um, the you know, method to extract consensus signatures. So let's say you, you have one perturbation or one pathway that has been studied by different studies, by different uh, labs. You know, there's different papers that might report, you know, this side goes up upon this perturbation. Another study reports the same side, but it goes down. So this kind of inconsistency you find all over the place, right? This might, due, might be due to, uh, you know, the, the, the labs, they use different cell types, experimental conditions, different protocols, or whatsoever. So what we try to do, we try to uh, come up with a consensus between at least two independently published signature, uh, like papers, you know, in order to include these, these signatures in our database. And we use this very similar approach to, compared to GSA. We actually extended that scoring scheme um, in order to look for these signatures. So we tested that against a very well uh, studied data set of EGF stimulated HeLa cells has been published a couple of years back now in 2014. It's a very good like systems biology data set to test your computational tools. So we picked that one because the authors used, uh, you know, nocodazole to mitotically arrest the uh, HeLa cells and also EGF to stimulate, uh, you know, phosphorylation uh, or like in general uh, uh, signaling. And both of these signatures are in our database. So this was our benchmark data sets. You know, if you can pick up these signatures, we, I think we are on a good track that what we are doing is, is the right way. And what you're looking here is the heat map of enrichment scores. So each... Um, the row here is an enrichment score of a signature, and here are like the different experimental conditions where the DMSO, blue is EGF, green is nocodazole, measured in different number of replicates, right? So here's four replicates, four replicates, here's six replicates. And uh, uh, luckily we see that nocodazole here in green, the highest enrichment actually we observe in the nocodazole treated sample. So that's a good, good thing, and the same is true for EGF, right? And also in the control sample, we don't see any consistent enrichment. So this was our, our kind of uh, you know, global approach to prove that you know, we are on a good track. And then we specifically focused on, on, um, on, the, on the clustering metric. So how well do these enrichment score cluster our data? And we compared it to a gene-centric approach. So here on the left, we look at this is, this is how clean our clustering is if we do a site-centric approach, and this is how clean our clustering is if we, if we first project it to genes, then do the same type of analysis. And we see that, you know, in a site-centric type of analysis, we see very clean clusters. So the higher these bars are, you know, uh, the, the better representative is, is my clustering. So, and also what we can see in the gene-centric space is that samples from uh, you know, uh, from the control and the DMSO are clustering together, which is not what we, what, we, what we would expect. And also, if you just look at these 
ETF and the quotas for signatures alone, so and, and compare these signature scores across these different treatments and, and compare site centric and gene centric, we definitely see that you know we see a higher enrichment compared to gene uh, to gene centric approach in the site centric approach for EGF and also for no cortisol. So meaning we can pick up or we have a better signal of our of the biological pathways uh, if we do it site centric compared to gene centric. And I think now I'm going to wrap up here. So these both, so these tools are available on GitHub and Gene Pattern. Um, there's many other tools that do similar kind of uh, things like Fox tracks um, that specifically look at kinase substrate interactions. You know, there's no other database that can do pathway or perturbation analysis, but there's other p databases that do kind of substrate analysis as we've, as, as we've talked about that this morning. And tomorrow, I think you want to, go, you, you're going uh, to uh, hear about Webgestalt and so on and so forth. So, and with this, I want to end my talk. Again, yeah, I put some references and I'm um, open for one or two questions before Bing is going to talk about. Any questions? Yes. So if we have, suppose for Greta, if we have 12 isoforms, so there will be the hyphen, hyphen 1, 2. So uh, have, like, uh, can we give uh, our data in that format? So we recommend to use the sequence windows, which I know that you, are, you don't have in your database, in your data set. But the sequence, you know, if you just represent the phosphocyte by its sequence window, by the flanking sequence, it's much more robust identifier. Yes. In this tool also, we have to give the sequence. You don't have to, but it's your, you're on the safer side if you do so. So today, in conclusion, you learned about GSEA and how it can be used for pathway analysis for all the different kinds of PTMs. We also learned that all the pathways are gene centric, all the databases are gene curated which may dilute your efforts. Hence we need a PTM curated database for proper analysis of PTM data studies. We also heard that why different IDs and different isoforms curation is important but very challenging. We also heard about the three signature categories of PTM SIG database. For example, perturbational signatures, signatures of molecular signaling pathways and signature of kinase substrate interactions. Curation of PTM sites using GSEA can be done manually by semi-automated or fully automated function. Based on this, they have also made PTM SEA or the modified version of GSEA to look at the signatures of PTMs. We also saw with an example that site centric data grouping is more efficient and properly grouped as compared to the gene centric. The next lecture is going to be hands on exercise by Dr. Kirsten to show us how one can use GSEA for pathway enrichment. Thank you.